click on speak. Great. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the final Mass Manchester talk for 2021. 20, uh, I'm Kirsty Fairclough, I'm the head of RKE for SODA, uh, which is School of Digital Arts. I'm a member of Mass and I'm absolutely delighted to um, welcome Marcus Hataya today to present his work, um, which is entitled Voicing Manchester Streets Through Sound Maps and Psycho Geography. Uh, I'm really delighted that Marcus is here presenting um, some of his PhD project work today and some of his other um, music based work. Uh, I am one of uh, Marcus's PhD um, supervisors, so it's great to have him presenting here. Um, in this talk, Marcus is going to introduce a digital sound mapping project, exploring the relationship between the self and Manchester's cityscapes. So a little bit about Marcus then. He's an electronic music producer, sound artist and doctoral researcher. When he's wearing his electronic music hat, he performs under the stage name Industries that links the post-industrial past of his German hometown to Manchester. Uh, within this space, he started producing and releasing his electronic music uh, following his studies at the School of Electronic Music in 2018. His music explores and subverts musical structures and ranges from field recordings, distorted sounds to harmonic melodies and large beats. As a sound artist, he an has an interest in sound walks and field recordings and collaborates across disciplines and media. His work, sound work ranges from sound art, audiovisual collaboration to workshops and podcasts. So he recently started his practice led PhD at Manchester Met, where he is working on a sound and media project, which you're going to hear about today, which explores the relationship between the self and Manchester through sound maps and psychogeography. So Marcus will present for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then I will turn over to the audience for questions. Also, feel free to pop them into the chat, or if you want to come onto camera and ask Marcus directly, and I know there are people in the physical room as well, um, you're welcome to do so. Just um, give me a, a kind of wave if you do want to uh, ask anything on, on camera um, directly to Marcus. So um, just to remind everyone, we are recording this session. Um, so, uh, yep, just to make everyone aware of that. And uh, Marcus... Uh, welcome, and uh, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, let me know if you have any issues hearing me or if anything is weird with the presentation. Um, but welcome to all the people in the physical space. Welcome to all the people in the digital space. Um, thank you, Kirsty, for your introduction. As you already know, the title of my project is Voicing Manchester's Streets Through Sound Maps and Psychogeography. That's a lot of terms. I'm gonna break it down a little bit and kind of present my PhD project, but also talk a little bit about my practice. It is part of the Mass MCR lecture series. Mass MCR, if you don't know, it's like music and sonic studies research group within MMU. And the lecture series is Digital Worlds, Music, Sound and Sonic Spaces. So there's more to come from other great people. So watch this space. Um, so today, I am gonna do a small introduction because you already covered a lot of stuff. Um, I'm gonna present my electronic music project industries to kind of see what kind of stuff I've done before I started my PhD. Then I'm gonna talk about why I decided to do a PhD. And then I'm gonna talk about my research project, Counter Silence, my PhD project. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a theoretical foundation, uh, the methodology, and a creative, the creative toolkit that I'm going to devise throughout the PhD. I'm going to give a little bit of examples of practice. So I'm still early on, I'm just my second year part-time, but there were like a few instances where I could try some of the elements of the creative toolkit. So I'm just going to give like a few examples of those. And I'm going to talk about impact. I mean, obviously, I hope that's going to have an impact if I get to the end of my project. Mm -hmm and references in case anyone that I can also share afterwards if there were some texts or quotes or anything that you found interesting. Um, it is a bit self-indulgent to put a picture of me on the slide, <laughs> but I thought you can see me like doing things on my laptop, which is like what electronic music producers do, right? When they perform. Um, but basically what I do, I would kind of like summarize it in three areas. One is like, I do electronic music, I do DJ and I do sound. That's me as the artist. And then I am doing a PhD, which is how I got to know all of you. 
So I'm kind of like doing research and kind of like I'm engaged in academia. But I also, when I'm not doing my PhD, I work in the arts and all the arts organizations I work with are doing participatory arts projects with young people. So that's another side where I kind of want to develop a facilitatory aspect to my artistry and my research. So basically, when you think about it, those are like the three areas that I kind of are interested in. It's like electronic music, academia, and the arts. And those are kind of three areas where I try to, where I basically try my PhD project to combine those areas, but I also want to develop myself in those areas. Um, I think this is going to, I'm going to pick up on that later on when you can see what the research outputs are going to be and how that kind of aligns with those three areas. This is basically me trying to make sense of the practice and the PhD. And Venn diagrams are a very useful tool to do that. Um, Industries, as Kirsty said, basically it was just a project name I came up with because I come from like a really actually a bit depressing German hometown that has like post-industrial ruins, but then it also has, has loads of nature. And I kind of always like the contrast between, you know, coming from a post-industrial city, but then having that nature aspect. And I think Industries is often like a term really associated with hard structures, but I kind of associate with like organic structures, like nature overgrowing those old industrial structures and all of that. But as you can see, before I even thought about like my PhD project, I already thought about place because that name is like place related. It's about thinking about the city. But anyway, I wanted to play a little bit of the stuff that I did when I started with that project, just to kind of because we're like a music and sonic studies group, so I think we should play sound. Um. I'm so happy. I thought I couldn't do a fade out, but I can actually do a fade out, which is really great. Um, so that's a song called Air, which basically uses field recordings of Manchester's rain. So when I moved to Manchester, I wrote that because I wanted it to be like airy and fluffy and it was raining the whole time. So I just used rain and I just used it as a backdrop sonically. Um, and then there was another track when I moved to Manchester that I did, which is called Reform, which uses construction side sounds. So that's a bit like the polar opposite. By the way, this is like both the artwork of my German housemate, um, which I also wanted to show because it looks great, but that's like a little glimpse of Reform, which uses construction side field recordings. <laughs> So that was like two really basic tracks that I did in the beginning. And then I dived a bit more to field recordings and during lockdown, I went for many walks, many lockdown walks and did field recordings of me walking through parks and stuff. And a friend visited me and we kind of like did basically a jam session using those field recordings and did two tracks, which are called a walk one and two. And it's about lockdown walks and it's a bit more using field recordings in a more intricate way, rather than just putting it as the background to the track. 
And we did actually really, really DIY music videos during lockdown, just in Alexandra Park. My housemate just started an MA in visual anthropology and borrowed a camera from university, which is kind of, you know, did it as an experiment. They're both two minutes each. So I think maybe just for the fun of it, I'm just going to play them. And yeah, I hope you're going to enjoy. Um, That was track number one. Oh my gosh. Thank you, thank you. And last practical example before we go into the theoretical stuff. This is a walk too. And you know, the first one was really vintagey, warm and nice. And this is like the Stranger Things nightmarish, creepy one. So enjoy. <laughs>
And basically, I mean, basically what you can see is like, I was interested in place related music and field recordings. And those were topics I was interested in. Why a PhD? So basically, I, did I do come from like a varied background. So in my undergrad, for example, I did comparative literature and linguistics. Then, but I always looked at sound, like sound and literature, sound and language. And I was always interested in music as well. And then in my master's, I did arts management because I was like, right, I'm going to do arts management. Then I can work in cultural organizations from like practically closer to maybe sound and music. But then, you know, uh, the two years after my master's, I was in Manchester, kind of like working part time and stuff and trying to get funding for sound and music projects. And it's really hard to kind of like find development opportunities and find funding to kind of develop yourself as an artist. And I was kind of thinking when the first lockdown hit about what I'm going to do next. And I kind of feel um, a practice-based PhD was kind of like the solution to all of my problems. That might sound exaggerated, but it seemed like a way to really, you know, develop those things in a really professional way. And actually, I also have to thank Susan, who's in the meeting, because she was my first contact at MMU, and because she is friends with my MA supervisor, and I was kind of led in that direction to have a conversation. So. Thank you, Susan, for kind of like helping me explaining what, helping me to explain what a practice-based PhD is and what it can do. Um, so obviously it's an opportunity to develop yourself artistically and to explore interests in sound and place more deeply, but also obviously kind of continue research and maybe think about research more deeply. And also because I work in the arts where I sometimes help facilitating workshops, I was like, maybe that's an opportunity where I can think about not only developing my own artistry, but how I can involve participants and share some of the things that I discover. So those were things that went on in my mind, like kind of like in those three areas, electronic music, academia, the arts, that could be all combined in that practice-based PhD and to develop all of that in one project, which might also lead to future opportunities for me to do something in all of those areas afterwards. Cool. That's just my thinking, how I went from like electronic music to a PhD. Counter silence, that's my PhD project. So basically it is an interdisciplinary digital media project. Um, it will entail exper experimental electronic music that might sound similar like some of the stuff that you heard. It might sound very different. We will see. Um, but basically it's about expressing the relationship between the self and the city through sound, specifically sound maps and psychogeography. And two questions that I ask myself is like, how can sound maps be used as a creative digital medium to map personal narratives of the city? And how can psychogeography be used as an artistic strategy to express one's relationship with the city? Um, and it's based on the idea that listening and understanding the relationship to place is a very embodied subjective experience. So it makes sense to do it as practice as research because you can evaluate your own subjective experiences, either mine or the participants' subjective experiences. So that's the mindset behind why it is practice-based. Um, and as I said before, it will inform my own artistic development, but it will also engage participants in the project. Um, so at the end, I hope that the participants and I benefit from it as some sort of artistic development. But also I want to make sure, I'm going to talk about the research outputs later, but I want to make sure that it reach, reaches like academic and artistic communities and arts and music organizations. So I want to, whatever is the outcome, I want to spread it. Um, but anyway, that's like in a nutshell, an introduction to the research project. The theoretical foundation is threefold. It consists of sound studies, sound maps and psychogeography. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those aspects. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about sound studies because most of you are familiar with it, but I kind of wanna cover some basics just to be on the safe side. Um, so basically um, as an introduction to sound studies, it is a transdisciplinary field of study um, that focuses on sound obviously, but it is not musicology or 
music studies as such. It is basically thinking of sound as a physical phenomenon and kind of um, exploring it from different disciplines that could be anthropology, architecture, um, media studies, cultural studies. It could even be musicology, but thinking about sound more as a physical phenomenon as opposed to music only. Um, and if you kind of look at like, I do have a list of references, but if you look at some of the introductory volumes of sound studies, you can see that all people that contribute are from all these different disciplines. Um, and that leads to the second point. It does match theory and practice because people that are interested in sound studies can be artists like me, for example, but it could also be people that only focus on theory. Um, so it's also like really, diverse in the sense that the theorists are both practitioners and just academics or both. Um, one thing that is important for my project is that sound studies is very much about reflexivity. So there's like one quotation that I would like to read. Um, so sound studies produce and transform knowledge about sound and in the process reflect reflexively attend to the stakes of that knowledge production. So how I, what I kind of read into that is reflexivity is really important in sound studies, basically. Um, and I think if I want to talk about subjective embodied experiences of sound through listening, I think it's really important to think about the reflexive element of sound and how you see yourself in your own listening experience, being a subject within a sonic environment. So that's one aspect that is important for my project reflexivity. Um, another important thing is that it stresses the sensory aspect of listening. Um, I forgot to say, I forgot to say one thing. Many people talk about the sonic or auditory term because since the 60s and even before, there was a term where people started to look at sound from an academic perspective and as in sound studies term more rigorous, rigorously. And some people like um, Schulz, Volker Schulze, who's like a, a German scholar, he connects that auditory turn also to like a sensory turn, as in, okay, we focus on the vision, um, on the visual for so long. Now we focus more on the sound, but it's only one step in maybe thinking about all the senses. So many people also think about this sonic turn as a first step to kind of consider all the senses and see it in alignment with the sensory turn. And Howes, who's kind of like writing a lot about that sensory turn, says the mind is, necessary, is necessarily embodied and the sense is mindful. I think that is kind of like really important because it's about that embodied experience of the senses, which includes sound sound as an embodied experience, something sensory. Um, another important factor of sound studies is that it encourages a critical awareness of the soundscape we inhabit. So Schaffer is like one of the most well-known scholars in that field because he basically invented the term soundscape, which he defines as like any acoustic field of study. And he uses the term sound mark to kind of mark those sounds in an acoustic environment, which is similar to landmark, only basically the auditory equivalent. And he uh, talks a lot about acoustic ecology, which is basically, he had a, he's like from a different generation and sort of saw the acoustic environment, environment more as something that needs to be humanized. For example, that noise in the cities is like pollution, pollution, and that we kind of need to make sure that you know, the acoustic environment is in harmony and we have like good sounds. I'm kind of like simplifying it really drastically just to make a point that nowadays the soundscapes of our environment are kind of, um, basically every sound is seen as meaningful and people look at like even things that were considered as noise, it's like something more meaningful. So in my project, I, for example, when I send myself or participants on sound walks, I don't want them to like only record bird song or like, you know, sounds that are considered beautiful, but anything that triggers any meaning. So basically all sounds are equal. That's the point I want to make. Um, 
And I think often we talk about, you know, with acoustic ecology and the soundscape, it's often like a focus on the space. Um, and I think what I want to focus on is basically to use sonic practices to think more about the subjective experience rather than how sound constitutes space. It's more about how do we experience this? How do we position ourselves within it? Um, so that's like an intro, really quick, really simplified introduction into sound studies. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the sonic cell, which is basically, because I talk about the embodied subjective experience and the relation between the self and the city, I need to think about what the self actually means. And my philosophical perspective is a Foucauldian one, as in like a very like, post-structuralist, fragmented idea of subjectivity. And Foucault obviously says that the subject is a product of disciplinary power. What I'm kind of thinking is like power is like all pervasive, it's like everywhere, but so is actually sound. So maybe a sonic self could be understood as like a product of all the sound that is around you. Um, but how do we understand the sonic self? I think it's important to think about the sonic self and really define what it can be in order to actually understand the relationship between the self and the sonic environment. And there's like one quotation I wanna read, um, which is very abstract, but I think it kind of encapsulates what I wanna say. The self is in terms, defined in terms of hearing rather than sight. It's a self imagined not as a point, but as a membrane not as a picture, but as a channel through which noises, musics, music and musics, sick, travel. I think I wrote music there twice. Mistakes happen, apologies. Um, but I think what it means like, you see sound as something like really that travels, it changes. And basically the self perceiving that, it's a very fragmented, messy process. And I think, I think that kind of aligns with the fragmented self that Foucault describes in terms of subjectivity. Um, but then the question is, how is that sonic self constituted when you go into more depth and think about the concepts of sound studies? And there are basically what I'm saying is that, and I'm going to like break this down a little bit, that effect through sound creates a sonic memory and therefore a subjective emotional link to the city. So effect is one of the most complicated terms ever. And I kind of feel like every time anybody mentions it, people get very confused. But I just have one quotation that will kind of like clarify everything immediately. <laughs> so effect can be described as a, an effect in terms of sound, I need to say. Effect can be described as a vibrational movement of bodies of all kinds, which can be understood as a base layer of sound which may activate or accrue layers of feeling and significance, but it's not reducible to them. So it's something very physical, like sound kind of like has a physical reaction and you might not even be able to conceptualize it yet because if you have feelings or emotions, then you, and you can like name them, then you already conceptualize it. So it's like the very beginning when sound is kind of like entering your body and you basically feel something but you can't conceptualize it yet. And the sonic memory, that's like my conceptual conceptualization of this. A sonic memory is kind of like when the feelings and emotions occur and you have like, you think like, oh, this made me feel sad or this made me feel like this. And then you have like a sonic memory. And I think those kind of moments and those kind of um, memories that occur are what creates that sonic self and the subjective thing to a place. So this is kind of, kind of where I'm at at the moment with the sonic self. Um, but basically a way to actually like, because it's like about subjective experiences, but how do you actually trigger that relationship to your sonic environment? That's where the sonic practices come in, um, which are a way to actually like put those abstract concepts into practice. So basically it's quite simple. There's gonna be sound walks, field recordings and electronic music. There's a lot of history and theories for all three of them, but for the sake of today, I'm gonna to like really quickly give a really quick snapshot of each. 
So in terms of sound walks, I mean, obviously walking is seen as a method in sound walks, that's quite obvious. And there's like a big history of walking from like the flaneur, like the male flaneur that kind of just like objectively overlooks the place and is not really engaged to the situationists, which was like a group of like French activists and writers in Paris in the 1950s that kind of used walking as a method to really actively engage with space and more as a really active engagement. And I think recently, as in the last 100 years or so, I'm very much simplifying just to kind of make a point, walkers are more seen as creative shapers rather than just objective observers. Um, and I think that's important, that it's like an active engagement with your surroundings. In terms of field recordings, I mean, obviously field recordings are recordings of your acoustic environment. And Ludwig Koch in the um, late 19th century was like the first one to use wax cylinders to make recordings of wildlife that then were later used by the BBC. And today we can use just a smartphone to make field recordings of whatever. So, but one quote that a quotation that I think is important is for field recording, it's very important how the field is defined. Sorry, for field recording, how the field is defined is at least as important as how the recording itself has been accomplished. So this means if you do field recording, you need to define what a field actually is. Like in my project, it is kind of the in-between space between the recorders and Manchester. Um, but it could be something completely different depending on the project. So you kind of need to make sure you define what the field is before you start doing field recordings. I mean, electronic music, that's where you can integrate field recordings. Um, with electronic music, it has basically two main origins. One strand of electronic music is music concrete, which is kind of more a strand of where in the beginnings, people used like acoustic field recordings to create music when electronic music, um, synthetic music was used. This is very simplified, but the point is that nowadays those two are very much merged because for example, there's so many people that since bedroom music was a thing in the nineties and bedroom producers were a thing and you could produce electronic music at your, in your home, people use both acoustic field recordings and synthetic music and merge them. And now it's like so blurred, like for example, when I played you a walk, you could hear the bird song and you could hear me walking through twigs, but the steel instrument that you heard was my kitchen bowl, which I basically sampled and transformed into a MIDI instrument. Is it acoustic? Is it synthetic? It's kind of both. Um, but basically, that's just to give you an idea that the acoustic and the synthetic are very much merged at this stage in electronic music. Um, so those are the sonic practices that I'm covering, which is kind of, um, this is kind of like sound studies in a nutshell in relation to my project, but then the medium to kind of express the sonic self and then sub that subjective uh, relationship is the sound map. I mean, sound maps kind of combine sound and mapping, which is probably obvious, but the coming together of those sonic practices and cartography can be defined as cartophony. Um, and basically one quotation that I really like is, sound maps bring together visual and sonic epistemolo epistemolo epistemologies and practices and offer rich ground for exploring how presentations of time and space are performed between and across the senses. It's basically a really flexible medium. <laughs> you can bend time and space. Basically now, especially with digital interfaces, you could do anything, which is really useful, but you really need to define what the function is and why you're using it. Um, and basically, depending on why you're using it, you can define which cartophony you base your sound map on. And there are different categorizations. They're really dry, so I did not list all of them, but two that are relevant for my project are mapping of sound, which is basically you just map sounds. That's, that's it, you map sounds. <laughs> and mapping of sound as interfaces. You use an interface, which can be a digital interface. 
that's it. Those two are two that I'm using. Um, and sound walks combined with field recordings can be a way to establish that sense of sonic self, like I said before. And my aim is to express whatever sound works come out of that and that digital sound map and have it as a medium. And artistic, oh, I forgot, I got some examples actually to make it, you know, there's like two examples I have here. The World Soundscape Research Project. That's one, but don't get it confused with Schaffer's World Soundscape Project, which was like, it's like essential thing, but this is actually a PhD researcher in Salford that did a World Soundscape Research Project where he basically asked people all around the world to use an app to upload their favorite sounds. And it was a quantitative research project where he wanted to see basically, he wanted to see what the sound, favorite sound marks are of people and what favorite sounds that exist. Thinking about like town planning and like, you know, designing cities, all of that. That's a quantitative way of using the sound map. Many of you might know Dr. Beate Peter, and I know she's in the meeting. So hi, Beate. Um, that's the last clever audio, digital audio map, which is a qualitative example because it kind of contains memories, voice memories of people that went raving and clubbing in Manchester. And it's a way to like capture that kind of sonic heritage. Um, so as you can see, often digital sound maps are used for research purposes to gather quantitative or qualitative data, um, but it can also be used as a simply like a creative medium for self-expression. And I think that's why I want to explore how it can be used as just a medium for creative self-expression. I know I'm aware that I'm in a PhD project and it is obviously also research, but I want to see how it can be a very creative, medium just for self-expression to kind of map those personal uh, subjective experiences of sound. So basically I wanna move from sound maps as a tool for research purposes to sound maps as a flexible creative medium for subjective self-expression. And I have like a few random references for, for example, in the middle ages, maps were seen as pictures in which a narrative was linked to a subjective experience because often we think of maps as something very like neutral, but in fact, it's not really neutral. And in the past, it was often seen just, that there's always like a subjective link to it. And cartography in general can be seen as a creative act and maps can be seen as an artistic expression. So that's just like some food, food for thought. And I think one of my favorite quotations is from Anderson when she says, as sound artists, academics and or enthusiasts we must explore the potentials of expanding the boundaries of the grid sound map platform. We must map the domestic and the private, the personal and the significant, the individual and the overlooked, the significance of sound and its meaning within our listening. It's basically anything that's important to us, we should map if it's like voices of people we love or I don't know, our neighbor bringing out a bin, whatever. We could map anything that's kind of important to us and we should we think beyond the grid and see it as a really flexible medium, which is kind of where I'm coming from. And like a strategy that is kind of like assisting me in that mission is psychogeography. Um, it, that will kind of underpin as a concept all the sonic practices. I mean, I personally, when people ask me what psychogeography is, I say it's kind of about how the city is perceived through the mind and the senses and kind of conceptualizing that. Uh, the term originally described geographical practices of the French situationists who were mentioned earlier in the 1950s in Paris. And uh, it was basically a group of like French activists and writers and basically an activist that basically disrupted spatial routines through drifting through the city and just like exploring space and like also thinking about political elements like capitalism and critiquing things that didn't agree with in the city. Disruptive walking is at the core of psychogeography. There's no common methodology between all psychogeographers, it's a difficult word, um, but obviously walking in a very engaged, active way 
and really thinking about everything that's around you in a really critical way is crucial. And the derive, which translates like a trip, to spend drifting through the city, is a common method, which I'm also going to use in correlation with my sound walks. Um, Basset, who did a project with students as well, where he went to Paris to do psychogeographical exploration of Paris, said that it can be described as a form of movement through the city with aesthetic and critical potential. So I will apply psychogeography as an artistic strategy to the more specific sonic practices of sound box and field recordings. Um, it's basically about evoking a more active engagement with space to kind of identify how psychogeography can be used as a strategy to express one's relationship with the city. Um, those were like the core foundations of my theory, but I want to bring it all together. So basically, sonic practices and sound maps are closely tied to psychogeography. On a conceptual level, sound walks and field recordings are like psychogeography, creative subjective practices that explore one's relation to and our perception of our sonic environment. On a methodological level, the method of walking into the reef will trigger like new subjective experiences during the sound box and will lead to new sounds that will be heard that then will be recorded through the field recordings. And basically the subjective experiences captured in the digital sound map, um, they hold like psychogeography the potential to subvert cartography through a subjective mapping of the city. So basically, sound studies, sound maps, and psychogeography are so closely linked and inform one another. So, and sonic mapping is kind of the term that kind of encapsulates all of that. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk too much about methodology, but in terms of like how do I realize the project? I mean, from a philosophical perspective, I already said it's like a post structuralist approach. Um, it is obviously a qualitative research approach because it's a very subjective experience. It's about the subjective embodied experience of listening to understand your relationship to place. Um, the research design is very much based on reflective practice-based research, which means it is obviously practice-based, but it's about reflection. For example, I will do, I will have a reflective journal with all the things that I will try. And with the participants, I will conduct three workshops with participants from Manchester-based music organizations that will reflect on their experiences in focus groups. So reflection is at the core of the project. Um, practice as research is a methodological framework, which many of you might know. I'm actually, I'm not sure, but there are so many practice-based PhDs in my cohort that kind of have practice as research as their main methodological framework. It basically means that practice is used as a way to gain new subjective knowledge. So basically implementing those sonic practices is a method to gain new subjective knowledge. Um, but practice as research is basically the concept that will allow me to actually implement that in my research project. Um, the practice, the actual practice, I would describe it as a creative toolkit. So what I talked about before, the sound box, field recordings, electronic music, psychogeography, I see it as one creative toolkit that I'm developing. Um, and basically the resulting sound works of the practice that I implement and the participants implement will be captured in a digital sound map. And that digital sound map will be made publicly available in the form of a smartphone app. So people will be able to listen to it and walk from Manchester and kind of listen to the sound works. I will absolutely leave it up to the participants whether they want to be credited, whether they want to share their work. It's just, it's more about the process. And, but I want also to give them a chance to kind of like put something out in the world, which might be also good for their own portfolio. Um, Basically, the data collection itself, however, will be through the reflective practice. So that's where the data collection happens, through the reflective journal and through the focus groups. The sound works will be an artistic output, but it won't be the actual data. The actual data will be the reflective practice and the reflection, I should say. And the qualitative data analysis, I'm going to do through coding and I'm going to use thematic analysis to kind of see what common themes there are in terms of like 
their experiences of using those sonic practices to express their relationship between themselves and place. That's the methodology in a nutshell. This is the creative toolkit. So you can see it one more time. You have the sound box and the Doreen. You have field recordings, electronic music, a digital sound hub, and psychogeography. It all informs each other. And I kind of feel like I already mentioned it many times. So I kind of feel like I don't need to go through it again, but you have it in one image. That's the practice. That's the great toolkit. Um, basically, in my PhD. I'm only in my second year part-time, so I did not have a chance to dive deep into the practice, but I was given a few chances to try some elements of what I want to do. So I took part in a workshop facilitator training with Manchester Rise, and it was called Manchester Rise Arts for Wellbeing Workshop Incubator. And basically it was about becoming a better facilitator, and I delivered a session online, which was well-being themed. And I called it listening to your home. And it was about just thinking about sound in a more general way and asking the participants to like go on little sound box in their own home and like record field recordings with their phone and bring them back. And I gave them like little prompts. It was basically about listening consciously in your home and thinking about maybe sounds that you really like, sounds that you don't like, sounds you might want to change, feel more comfortable because it was also during lockdown and it was about finding another way to be more mindful in your own home. Those were like, I used to whiteboard function on Teams. <laughs> so, oh, I kind of see it's like hidden by Zoom a little bit. Oh, one second. Sorry to the digital room. This is, an, uh, yeah, okay. So what do you associate with the term sound was one thing that I kind of asked. It's really interesting to see what people came up with. That was just like a general question. Nature, peace, club, politics, oven, music, conversations, devices, concerts, rituals, debates, silence, television. I like it. <laughs> and then I kind of asked what sounds they have in their home. People said sound of the highway, washing machine, bathroom light and fan, kettle, fridge, children screaming, mum on a phone call someone moving things around and that got people to talk about and also connect with one another. I'm gonna play you one sound from my home. Um, you have to guess what it is. This is becoming a workshop now. You have to guess what it is. Oh no, where's my mouse? Oh yeah. It's one of these. <laughs> yes. Um, just for the digital room, Katie said it's the bathroom light and fan, which is true. I'm going to play you one more just because it's fun. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to ask the people in the digital room. Oh, anyone in the digital room, do you have any idea what that sound was? Making a cup of tea? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what it was. So it's the kettle. I guess it was Stephen, right? Well done. <laughs> um, the last question I asked him was to how to redecorate their home sonically, to kind of think about what could you change? Um, opening the window to hear the outside world. That's always a good one, and you should do it once in a while. Kids sit quietly. I think that was a very angry mom. Um, ask housemates not to walk up the stairs late at night. That was me when I was really sensitive to sound. I don't even care anymore, but I was really sensitive to sound. It was like, I can't hear the stairs anymore. Play music, Bluetooth speakers. Yeah, get, get some vibe going. Oil squeaky doors. That's me, I actually did that. It drove me nuts. Buy noise canceling headphones if you need some silence. That was also me and I did that. <laughs> Get earplugs if you need more silence at night. Maybe if you have housemates. I don't think I said it, but it's also one thing I did. <laughs> yeah, 
but anyway, that was interesting to think about how you can get people to talk about sound, to get like a workshop about sound started and to think about sound really generally. Another thing, oh, not again, not again. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing was, I did present at the annual Park Symposium. Park stands for Postgraduate Arts and Humanities Center, um, which is the faculty that we're all part of. And I presented like, it was an MA PhD collaboration. So I collaborated with an MA student in architecture and he designed a poster, but it kind of presented a commission that I did, which is called Sound Pass. You don't need to read everything in detail, but this was how the poster looked like. And Sound Pass was basically a commission by Brighter Sound, a music charity in Manchester. And it did a walking and running app in Moston. And it was about, basically there was a composer, a Dutch composer who all facilitated the project. And they invited local Manchester <coughs> artists to contribute soundscapes for the app. So when people walk through Moston or like run through Moston, they can open an app and basically um, it's GPS triggered. And wherever they are, they might hear like a singer songwriter singing in one street where this person lives or somebody rap in another part. And when you go past the Bluebell Park, you can hear my soundscape, which is mixed between, basically it's a park and people used to go there and sing, but I did it during lockdown and I went to Mosson and there was no one there. So I kind of like reported the cars, water running down the drain, and I found an old Facebook video of people singing in the park and I kind of like merged that together. So I'm going to play that to you. It's just a minute. Yeah, so that was fun. And what you see at the top is actually a screenshot from the app. So if you go outside of the area, it says no sound, outside all echoes. Echoes is the name of the software. So, you know, if you go outside of the area where, where it's called the sound, the music stops. And the poster, I just have to say, Adil Nagdawala, who designed the poster, is a genius because it is a poster. You can see he integrated field recordings. This is Moston. He designed that map of Moston. And when we play one bit of the field recording, it lights up the area where the field recording was recorded. And then it enlarges one part of the poster. So it becomes a presentation, a poster, and sound map in one. I just want to say he's a genius. But that's basically, that's a very like, artistic way of being created by using a sound map, which is why this commission was really important for my research project, because it showed me how you can like use the software Echoes, which is probably the software I'm going to use to really map all sorts of sound works in a really creative way. So I learned a lot. Last example, there's a group called Loiterous, Loiterous Resistance Movement, which is a cycle geographical group led by Morag Rose. And it's a group of like, maybe anarchists is too much. It's like a great group of artists and like people interested in like urban walking, cycle geography. And they do every month, they do like a first Sunday walk together. And I joined them. I know of Mora and we kind of email a lot, but I actually never went to a physical walk because I joined during lockdown, but then we went on one remote walk. And then I was like, wait a minute, maybe I could do that with a sound walk and just try something out. So we did like a remote sound walk that I facilitated via WhatsApp. So basically it was a WhatsApp group of lots of people. And um, 
it was based on the degree. So people were drifting into different directions. We were not in the same space. And it was about like spontaneously taking different routes and just drifting about. And basically in the first remote online walk that I took part in, that I didn't facilitate, the first one I took part in, people shared pictures of where they were walking. So I was like, this time around, we're gonna use the voice note function and send each other field recordings, which was a great idea, but I had a complete sensory overload, but you can imagine the amount of, because you were listening, but then you had like 20 messages with field recordings and I had my headphones and I had my field recorder as well. It was insane. Anyway, then we all got home, made us a cup of tea and then met on Zoom. And then we shared little drawings of, uh, our sound walks. And basically, I would call this like a sound map as well, but it's like drawn. So you can see this is like where I live, my door. <laughs> <laughs> and there are loads of birds here. This, and I kind of walk towards Black Fields Park. I'm kind of between Mossai, Fallowfield, and Rush Home. And it was a big fun fair here. And this is Princess Road, which is like really loud. And I don't know what the question mark was. I think there were some weird sounds here. Anyway, that was like a way to like test a little bit of psych geography and sound works and also how to facilitate things online again. So what I want to say, that was not a structured way to explore the practice, but it was more like little ideas that I could test in a small capacity. Next thing is going to be me doing it in a more structured way. And if I get to the end of all of this, <laughs> those are gonna be the outputs of my research. So the artistic output is gonna be sound maps, uh, one sound map. The academic output, I'm gonna write a thesis, there might be a publication, and the participatory output, I'm not sure if that's the right phrase, but basically what comes out of the workshop and participatory element will be the creative toolkit as a workshop template that can be shared with arts organizations and that kind of comes back to that beginning, those three areas. As an artistic, I mean, it will be electronic music in the sound map. It is an artistic product. It will be a research project. And there will be some sort of output that can be used as a workshop template for participatory arts organizations. The impact. As I said, it will be an artistic development opportunity for me and the participants. Um, and also like making those left field sound art practices more accessible to maybe young people that haven't had any idea about those before. Um, and kind of provide tools to express our subjective relationships to place, which might strengthen our sense of belonging to place. And also provide a template for future music workshops with music and arts organization in Manchester and beyond. Um, those are my references, and I want to thank you for listening, pun intended. <laughs> thank you. Was, yeah. Thanks so much, Marcus. That was brilliantly comprehensive and also very entertaining, so thank you. And we've got um, about half an hour, I think, um, to see if anyone's got any questions for you. I'm sure people will have after that. So um, let's see who wants to uh, who wants to ask first, either in the in the either room, of course. I don't want to ask you any. It'll feel like a PhD vibe, Marcus. I think I um, I think Katie has a question. Go for it, Katie. Real space. <laughs> we we can't hear Marcus. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. you know what? Right. It's completely my fault. I muted myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious about the with the work you've done so far in terms of um, working with participants. In relation to the idea of connecting to the space, and especially mm. you young people, is that going to be a focus going forward, young people? But um, like in terms of anyway, connecting to the space, what kind of things have come back from that? And um, first of all, it's going to be young people, eighteen to twenty-five, so not like school age, but more like young adults. 
but it's more like maybe because that's the focus of the arts organizations I've been working with and kind of like because most of them are just kind of like in the beginning to figure out you know gaining music skills and all of that I think it's a great age to just gain some insight into different areas and like that's the age that most of the workshop participants in the arts organizations where I work uh, are and um, I mean the thing is like the little things that I did now so far I mean only the online workshop for Manchester Rise was with participants and it was just about their home as a place I kind of feel I kind of feel I'm not sure what I got from that because I feel it was like on teams and I think it was and it wasn't like properly evaluated you know I wouldn't see it as it was like a testing maybe testing like an idea to talk about sound and stuff maybe think about what it means in terms of your home but I think it wasn't like a properly executed part of my research but more like you know kind of like testing this kind of so I kind of feel like I didn't get too much back yet because the actual participatory element will be properly developed by me and is probably going to take place next year, if that makes sense. I wondered about the cool WhatsApp walk drawing thing you did, if the people that you did that with had yeah. any responses to, like, change responses to their environment or maybe they yes. comments. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that was actually because there were like some, because they are all, psychogeography fanatics, they had a lot to say. It was really good. We were on Zoom for like one hour, one and a half hours. And they talk about which paths they took, where they went, um, how it made them feel. That was like really rich, that conversation. So I guess it's about maybe what I learned is to, if the more comfortable few people feel, the more they feel at ease, the more they kind of talk about their experiences. So I think if I'm, when I'm going to conduct the workshops, you know, I want there to be snacks. I want there to be, you know, a vibe where people just feel like comfortable. So maybe that's what I got from there, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Anyone else got any questions in the either room? If you want to pop them in the chat, if you're in the digital room, feel free or just um, uh, jump onto camera. On the Oh, Mark. somebody. Hi, Steve. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure, Marcus. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. It was really informative and really stimulated a lot further thoughts. I thought it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, the going back to the sort of um, the notion of psychogeography, I think what, one of the uh, ideas behind that practice is that. Um, is that you're tapping into deeper elements in the city. So not just what's there superficially uh, on, you know, as you walk the city, but the, the kind of accumulated histories within buildings, within objects in the city. And I wondered, is, 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 um, is, a, is a sort of sonic practice able to, to, to sort of tap into those things? Or, or, or is it just capturing the sort of, you know, quotidian everyday sounds of that of, of the present can it tap into that sort of deeper history of the city oh good question i think at the moment i kind of feel ideally i was thinking you know when you kind of drift you sometimes stumble upon visual elements like for example when the situation is kind of like looked at, I don't know, commercial places and would like critique that and would maybe, you know, stumble across parts of the city where there would be like, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that, and would kind of tap into, you know, something that has substantial meaning that you could really dive into. I think it's maybe similar, but only thinking about. I think some, the problem is obviously like with visual stuff, if you have like an old building that has been there for 200 years, it might still be there, but maybe sounds from a long time ago might not be there. So what you hear is maybe just things that are quite 
yeah, every day, like, and maybe don't carry as much depth. But then I feel like what I want to tap into is maybe how that act of drifting might lead them to sounds that they wouldn't expect to hear. And maybe think about what meaning it contains for them to then think about what that means for the subjective relationship to that sound and to the place. But I'm not sure what the content is going to be, what people are going to come up with. So I will need to maybe test some of that practice, but also think about how to kind of like give a framework or some sort of like guide to make sure. I mean, I can't control that it will work, but those are definitely things that we'll need to think about. Okay, thank you. Great question, Steve. I think Beata has a hand up. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. That was great. I really enjoyed that. Um, and and uh, actually, maybe a thought here would be kind of partly responding to Steve's question, but also maybe to give you an idea. It's like whenever you have disruption or interruption, it might give you an idea of, you know, historical um, of change. And, and that might hint at a kind of a coming together of different histories or an overlapping of a previous history and a new history. So I think, Marcus, you said this in a way when, when you hear something that you maybe don't expect to hear when you have a certain image in front of you. And this kind of non-fitting of the sound and the image might give an idea about history, how specific that can be, I don't know. But, but it might be a good point then to, to just identify those spaces um, where it doesn't fit what our expectations are about these places. Just thought. That's a good thought. That's a really good thought. Thank you, Beata. Um, I just see like Matthew waving from the side. Um, is that okay if he asks a question? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a question, but basically it's the same question. Uh, We can't hear Marcus. We can't hear you, Marcus. You're muted. <laughs> it's all right. This is complex <laughs> tech. Doing well. <laughs> now, I was just saying that uh, I had a question, but it was basically the same questions that you asked. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, just because at the beginning you described your both your own town and Manchester in terms of ruins, mm. which is a concept which is. Uh, connects very tightly both space and place and time. I was wondering mm. how can this kind of time dimension merge to some mappings and uh, field recordings? And is there such thing as like a sonic ruin that can like kind of a remnant that can emerge through the, the sound mapping or not? I don't know. I think I also don't know. Um, <laughs> um, you said before, like, yeah, maybe you have an old building and the sounds, the yes, or, yes, not there anymore. But still, the building, the same old building. So, maybe what's happening sonically inside the buildings kind of like uh, influenced by the building itself, which is a ruin. I, know, I think I, I get you. I think, I mean, obviously, I don't know what participants or I will come up yeah. with when we go into our sound blocks, but I could imagine that maybe if you hear a sound in an abandoned area where there used to be loads of mill work or whatever, mm -hmm. but you hear a sound that might be mismatching, that you might think about what there used to be. I don't think there might be a sonic reverb from like a hundred yeah. years ago, but maybe the reflection on that might reveal a mismatch where it's like, oh, now it sounds all happy and cheery but actually that place used to be horrible and maybe in those reflections that might be revealed you know that's what i'm guessing yeah but it's Absolutely. good to think about mm. that susie has just put something in the uh, chat there susie i don't know if you want to um explain what that links to or, or not hello um, it's just in response to the people who've been asking about the potential of retrieving 
historic sound and this project my ma project is around um augmenting historic environments with sound and this particularly caught my eye because they um recreated the acoustic environment of saint paul's and then explored how things could have sounded using that acoustic simulation so there's a certain element of extrapolation based on the sound physics um but i still thought it was sounded like a really fun way to um spend some time i'll have a look at that i just saved it <laughs> that sounds pretty good thanks susie and i think uh, ankita has a um put a couple of thoughts in the chat there is it possible to give sound framework to future cities how can these two be collaborated that is sound and future surprises or uncertainty. And can we have a concept of resilience and adaptation in that regard? Wow, that's a really tough question. I mean, um, I kind of think in terms of future cities, I kind of, I'm looking at Katie over here. I think this is kind of like more your area, I think, isn't it? I mean, you don't need to say anything, yeah, but if yeah, you want to, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't want to put you on the spot at all. I mean, I suppose, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a big question. To give sound framework to future cities. I mean, I could imagine that whatever comes out of that project might reflect the relationship of young people aged 18 to 25 to their sonic environment in Manchester, which might contain some information on what it would like to change, maybe. So that could be something that could be interesting for policy or something like that, but also things that I don't know much about. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> about that too, because we're both working with young people. Mm. And one of the things when you talk about digital mapping and so on is that the generations that we're talking to I might potentially be younger. Mm. but live partially in the digital domain or like a lot in the digital domain. Mm. So I think that negotiation between the real and the digital is particularly fascinating in terms of that, in terms of looking ahead. And um, it could be maybe even like, I mean, those people that participate in this project, for example, could also be involved in a consultation or something, but it could be a consultation about sound and future cities. So in terms of collaboration, yes, absolutely. The concept of resilience and adaptation, I think I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that would entail. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question if anyone has one. No, in that case, thank you very much, Marcus. That was really fantastic. What a great um, way to spend uh, an afternoon. Really brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who came along. And um, please look out for more of our Mass Manchester uh, talks in the new year. Um, so uh, have a great holiday, everyone. And uh, please stay safe and well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh well God. done, Marcus. Yeah, sorry, I was just kind of like thinking about the recording.